Well, good evening. I'm Matt Stanford. I'm the uh, CEO of the Hope and Healing Center and Institute, and you are in the island, which is the youth building uh, of uh, St. Martin's. They're gracious enough to let us use that because they're a little bit larger crowd tonight. Um, and so welcome. The Hope and Healing Center is a mental health resource for the community. We offer uh, supportive services uh, for individuals with serious mental illness and all types of mental health and addictive problems. Uh, so if you or your family members are struggling with that, we have a wide variety of services available right in the building right next door. All of our services are free of charge. Uh, we also offer programs like this for the community to educate and raise awareness around mental health issues uh, as well as do research and training in faith communities. So please, if you're interested in any of our services, uh, you might check out our website, which is just hopeandhealingcenter.org or uh, get some of the flyers that are in the front where you first came in in the building next door. So it's my great pleasure to introduce uh, our uh, speaker tonight, uh, who I've known for a long, long time. Actually, we were just talking about that at dinner. Uh, uh, Thomas Joyner went to college at Princeton and received his PhD in clinical psychology from the University of Texas. He is the Robert O. Lawton Distinguished Professor in the Department of Psychology at Florida State University. Uh, Dr. Jordan's work is on the psychology, neurobiology, and treatment of suicidal behavior and related conditions. He's the author of over 610 peer-reviewed publications, and he's the editor-in-chief of the journal Suicide and Life-Threatening Behavior. He is the recipient of any, uh, uh, any number of awards, including the Guggenheim Fellowship, uh, the Rock Rockefeller Foundation Bellagio Residency Fellowship, a uh, Young Investigator Award from the National Alliance for Research on Schizophrenia and Depression, the Sakow Award for Early Career Achievement from the Division of Clinical Psychology, the American Psychological Association, and just a, a number of awards that Thomas has done an incredible uh, job uh, in his career. Um, he's a consultant to NASA and Human Research Program. He's a director uh, with Pete Gutierrez of the DOD-funded Military Suicide Research Consortium, a $300 million project. Um, and uh, he's the author of, or edited, author or edited 18 different books, including Why People Die by Suicide and Myths About Suicide, which we actually have over here uh, available to you if you're interested. Uh, he's been um, on the Dr. Phil show. Uh, he's been on Oprah. Uh, he's been uh, really all over here, and really Thomas is really one of the well, exceptional suicide researchers in this country, really in the world. Uh, and I knew him when he was his very first faculty job, we both worked at UTMB in Galveston, if you can, very, if you can even imagine. Uh, and so we were both much younger then. Uh, but it was a really special place. And so I really am happy that he's here, and I thank him for being here. And, and uh, he's going to have some great things to tell us tonight. So Dr. Thomas Joyner. Hey, good evening. Thanks, uh, thanks Matt, for that. Um, Generous, kind introduction. Um, none of that will probably stick with you, except maybe Dr. Phil. That's part of the people that sticks. Um, that's true. I did go on that show. It's fun. Um, tonight, I'm going to walk you through some concepts that my, my colleagues and I have developed, trying to answer the question implied by the title. Namely, why does this happen to people? Why does it destroy their lives and bereave their family members? I've got a partial answer, I think, at least, to that vexing question. And I think it's a kind of interesting answer in general and also of use to those of you who are mental health professionals in day-to-day -day um, mental health practice. So we'll get to all that shortly. A couple preliminary things. Email right there on the um, slide. Um, if you need to follow up, feel free. Uh, I'm going to show some videos tonight. Nobody's going to get hurt in these clips, uh, much less killed. But some of them are pretty dramatic. Um, you know, germane to the topic. And so I just want you to know that that's in the presentation. Mostly they're, they're pretty vivid. They, they illustrate vividly a lot of the ideas that I'm going to be sharing with you this evening. Um, also wanted to say that, um, you know, if you have a question for me, I mean, one, 
resource is my email address, but another way to do it is uh, raise your hand. I'll get, I'll get to you. I'd be happy to take questions, and, and we're going to have a little bit, a little bit of time afterwards to, for more questions. I invite that. Uh, in fact, that's better for me um, if I don't have to just talk straight through. I can do that. I'm a college professor. I do that a lot, but um, more fun for all of us, I think. There's a little back and forth. <clears throat> you hear me okay, by the way? There's a, it's good in the back. Is it okay? Good. And then um, one final note um, for now, and uh, it's that many of you yourselves, I, I, I take it, I would assume, have been bereaved by suicide in your own families. And I just want to um, share a note of sympathy. Um, it so happens that I'm in that same boat too. Runs in my family. So I do get it from that angle. Um, very much so. That's not really going to be the focus that I'm taking uh, tonight. But that's always with me. And I think you'll, I hope you'll see that it affects the, the, the thinking and the presentation. All right. With that, I'm going to begin right off the bat by getting out of this PowerPoint slide, or file rather, and then showing you a video. Getting to the point where now I'm going to pause it for a moment. This is man. I'm only he, nobody's going to get hurt. He'll hear much less kill. But he's going to be talking into the camera. He's holding a, a video camera. He's by himself. He's in the woods of the Pacific Northwest, where over the course of years he has constructed a bunker in the woods, stocked it, weapons, fuel, food, etc. in there. Now, what he's contemplating, as you might have already gathered, it's kind of given away a little bit, uh, is a murder-suicide. Now, we're not really focusing on that tonight, but some of the principles are similar between murder-suicide and Suicide per se, which we are focusing on tonight, suicide per se. One of those principles that is in common is how fearsome it is to try and stare death in the face and not blink. That's what murder suicide requires, and so does suicide per se. Say whatever else you might want to about it. It requires an unblinking, unflinching ability to stare down death. As we'll see, many, many people who very genuinely want to kill themselves can't, don't. Because at the last minute, at the last instant, something kicks in and stops them. I'm going to argue that that something is a very deep self-preservation instinct. Further, I'm going to argue that in order to overcome that very powerful force, people have to go through a process, and it's a very difficult process, and most people don't go through it. Therefore, most people don't take their own lives, but tragically, as we know, some do. And part of that story is a learned fearlessness, unblinkingness, in the face of death. Think about that idea as you notice this fellow talking for 30 seconds or so about what he's contemplating. Make some observations about him too. Just trying to live and pay bills and live as a civilian and go to work. I just It just freaks me out. It's actually more comfortable for me to think about living out here 
um, robbing banks, pharmacies, just taking what I want for as long as I can. At least it'll be exciting. It won't be boring. And I don't have to worry about Lynette or Kayleen. And everything will be taken care of. It'll just be me. I'll pause it there for a second. Notice anything about him? Got it. Got it. I'll put that in the microphone in case you didn't hear the answer. He's not blinking. I'm going to play it again in case you missed it. I missed it too the first few times I saw it. But he's not blinking. I'll play it again in a second. You'll see it. Let's put that to the side for a moment. Real important. We're going to get back to it. Also, pretty unemotional isn't he? He's kind of wooden and flat. That's peculiar when you're talking about something as momentous as killing your wife and daughter, which he does plan to do, and which he in fact does, and then killing himself. Unemotional in the face of that, that's interesting. And uh, literally unblinking. If you didn't catch it, let me just replay at least a part of that. And just count. Just simply simply count how many times he blinks. I'm getting to the point where I'm just trying to live and pay bills and live as a civilian and go to work. I just, it just freaks me out. It's actually more comfortable for me to think about living out here. Um, robbing banks, pharmacies, just taking what I want for as long as I can. At least it'll be exciting. It won't be boring. And I don't have to worry about Lynette or Kayleen. So can you see the little number here right there? It's 30 seconds. How many blinks did you, did you count? You can make a case. Did you say half? You can make a case for a one, like, partial... Really, the answer is zero, maybe a half. That's highly peculiar. The usual blink rate in folk is once every three to four seconds. He didn't blink at all in 30 seconds. Now, this could be due to any number of things. There are drugs that affect your blink rate. Prescribed drugs, some do, and illicit drugs, some do. So it could be that. It could be any number of things. We've looked into those alternative views and settled on this story, which is anytime a human is about to do anything that's momentous, requires effortful concentration, requires a staring down, of something fearsome, daunting. Any time a human tries anything like that, this is how their blink rate is affected. Doesn't matter what it is. It can be something appalling, like a murder suicide. It can be something like a concert pianist in whatever, Carnegie Hall. Something like that. That's momentous too. That requires Effortful concentration, too, and that will affect your blink rate. One other thing here. He's not really talking yet about his own death. He's ambivalent. He's thinking, eh, maybe I can play it out here in the woods, rob banks, rob pharmacies, rob stores. Yet, he is also thinking about his own death, and that's, in fact, what happens within hours of this. Isn't that interesting? He's not very ambivalent about the terrible murders of his wife and daughter. He is ambivalent about his own death. That's revealing of a more general principle. Killing is hard. We're not wired for it. Killing yourself might be even harder still because not only does it develop or sorry, does it require killing, but it requires dying? We're scared of those two things, deep in our natures. And this thing requires both of those. Something to, to ponder. Yes? Yes. 
Interesting. That's really interesting. In case you couldn't hear that, that the observation is about his breathing rate, respiratory rate. That's really interesting because what I'm suggesting is that part of him is fearless, it's the unblinking, unemotional. But he's got a human body, and that's not going to be totally wrapped into that. There's going to be some expression of that. You can sometimes hear it in the blink, in the Breathing, right, that's an excellent point. All right, let's, any other quick questions or observations about this fellow? Good, all right, let's go on. Let me pivot back to this for a moment, this slide series. And let me introduce you to this model. This is really the main idea that I want to impart to you today is, is this set of ideas conveyed right here. Because this really is a visual summary of, of all that I want to convey to you. This, that's a little bit simplified, but it's not a bad summary, visual summary of the ideas. Now, we'll put a little more detail on all this for sure. But for starters, let me focus your attention to the right side of this image, where you got, well, what it says there is those who are capable of suicide. Capable, that's a pretty important word in, in this model. That's the part I, I was just referring to, where you got to be capable of doing something that's very difficult to do. And that capacity... No, not everyone has it. So that, that's the idea that a certain kind of fearlessness of physical pain, ordeal, harm, death itself, fearlessness of those things, that's a necessary thing for people to progress on to death by suicide. Necessary but not sufficient. Got to have more. If you just have that, let's do something for a second. Focus your mind for a second just on the red part. Forget about all the rest of it for a moment. Just the red part. And forget that we're here to talk about suicide prevention for a moment. Just the red part. Fearless of physical ordeal. Can you think of some walks of life where that, capacity, that characteristic would be helpful. Military, firefighter, law enforcement, for example. Surgeon. I wouldn't want my surgeon afraid of blood, you know, scared of bodily or, you know, you can't have a surgeon like that. Now, let's put it back in this context. Now, in this context, fearlessness goes from something useful, admirable, that's admirable, fearlessness is in a firefighter, in the men and women, women in uniform who are protected, that's admirable. In this context, though, it gets shifted to something that's not really, I don't really think of it as admirable anymore, I think of it as sad and savage, and it might be deadly. Context matters. What shifts the context? It's the things on the left of the image. So let's talk about those for, an inst for a moment. Um, let's start with the top. It says perceived burdensomeness there. That's a pretty straightforward concept. It really, it just means... Here's the idea. You think that if you're going through this, you will think that your death will be worth more than your life on balance. That's what you're thinking. Perceived, that, that's, that word's important here. Because the argument here is not that, let's, let's take my own family members who died by suicide. I don't think they were a burden. 
On the contrary, they thought they were a burden. That's, that's the difference. And they died based on a misperception. That's tragic. But they didn't know that. That's tragic too. So that's the idea. My death will be worth more than my life to other people. But even that's not sufficient according to this view. You need to have a third idea in your mind. And there it's the idea that you're hopelessly cut off from people. You're hopelessly lonely, socially alienated. So let's put all this together. Here's the idea in a nutshell. If you believe that your death will be worth more than your life, if you feel hopelessly alienated, according to this logic, you'll develop the genuine desire for death. However, that's not sufficient. You also need to be fearless enough to act on that desire. Meaning that it's only the people in that small area of overlap that we lose. That little overlap is purposefully pretty small to convey that This tragic form of death, on the one hand, it happens way too frequently. 100 people, more than 100 people, more than 100 of our fellow Americans died today by suicide. That's way too many, on the one hand. On the other hand, more like 3,000, 4,000 of our fellow Americans died from heart disease. 8,000, 10,000 if you throw in cancer. Today, alone. In a relative sense, suicide's rare. Models got to be compatible with the relative rarity of death by suicide, and this model is. I'd like to dwell for a few minutes on common misunderstandings about suicide and how this model contradicts those myths. Let's start with the idea that you might have heard, or heck, I don't know, you might even kind of believe this, that suicide is cowardly, or that it's weak. That's actually a pretty common attitude in folk. In that connection, ponder the concept on the right side of this image. Can it be simultaneously both about fear, cowardice, weakness, and fearlessness? One of those has got to give. And the evidence suggests that really cowardice doesn't have much to do with it. Weakness doesn't have much to do with it. Never mind that it's very lacking in compassion To put it that way, never mind that. It's just not true to start with. Contradicts the the myth. Turn to another one. You might have heard this too. Or, I don't know, some of you might even kind of believe it. Suicide's selfish. Now here, let's be careful about what the suicidal person felt at the time of their death. And what, for example, the bereaved family members feel to this day, sometimes. Bereaved family members, including my own self, in the wake of my loved one's death, have the understandable feeling, how could he have done that to us? Seems selfish. Totally understandable. On the one hand. On the other hand, what does that have to do with what the person him or herself was feeling at the time. Maybe nothing. They thought it was the selfless thing to do. Now that they were wrong, that's for sure. But they didn't know that. See how this idea, right off the bat, just starts to shoot down these misunderstandings. There's a few others that we're going to 
get to. In fact, I think coming up in the next slide, let me get there. Where's my clicker? There we go. No. That's where I want to get to. I'm going to, I'm going to blank that out for a second. Now, this slide has it. We were talking for a moment about myths, misunderstanding. We talked about cowardice. We talked about selfishness. And now I want to turn to a third commonly misunderstood thing. And it's having to do with alcohol, the role of alcohol. Now, to get this in your mind, got to keep two ideas separate. One is... Or really, it's kind of the same idea, it's just different versions of it. One is a long-term time frame. That's, that's years, month, decades, sometimes years, months, before an eventual suicide. Okay, that's one time frame. Another time frame is the minutes and hours. That's different. Let's remember the difference between those two time frames as we talk about this next slide, which basically has to do with how much are people drinking, typically, in the minutes and hours before death? That's a question. The answer may be surprising to you. Not much. Not much. I'll walk you through this. On the up and down axis, you got numbers. Just, just basically numbers of people. Black bars died by suicide. White bars by homicide. All by knife. Along the bottom, different blood alcohol content at autopsy. This is where it gets a little confusing because this metric's maybe not familiar to many of you but it maps right on to the metric you are familiar with. In our country, the legal limit, 0.08%. That's 80 in this metric here. So the third category from the left, where it says 50 to 100, that's, that's where the legal limit is right there. Okay? So... Big thing jumps out at you about this slide. Large black bar to the left of the graph. Those are the suicide decedents who have no alcohol whatsoever, or some of them had one drink at the time of their suicide. And then, you know, a, a human nature being what it is, there's going to be variety, and there is, you can see it, but... With the suicide decedents, there isn't much variety here, really. There isn't any to the right side of the graph. There's no suicide decedents out there who are that intoxicated. There are some homicide victims who are, but no, no suicide decedents. They're all concentrated on the left side of the graph. Very little alcohol in their system at the time of their suicides. Not consistent with the idea that people are very drunk at the time of death, time of suicide. Not true. Now, let me rush to counter some objections that may be forming in your mind. You might counter. Well, this is obviously just one study. It's in Stockholm, Sweden. It's just of one method, self-inflicted knife wound. Maybe it's not representative. Good question. To, to answer it, we meta-analyze the whole literature we could find. That means you get individual studies and you pool it all together in one big meta-study, meta-analysis. When you do that, hundreds of studies on hundreds of thousands of people all died by suicide, all had their blood alcohol content assayed at death. Looks like this. Same pattern, exact same pattern. Now, within meta-analysis, 
you can do what are called moderator analyses. Now, this is, this is boring stuff, but I'll, I'll explain it. All that is is, does the same pattern apply to subgroups? Does it work the same in men as it does in women? Yes. The answer here is yes. Okay. Does it work the same for people of different ethnicities? Yes. Does it work the same for people who use different methods? Knife wound, going shot, ligature, on and on. Answer is yes. Here, the answer is yes. Pretty robust binding across all those variables. Here's another objection you may form in your mind. Maybe this has only to do with alcohol. There are other drugs. Maybe there's a ton of other drugs on board in the minutes and hours before death. No. Plausible, but no. It looks like this. Okay. Here's another objection. Perhaps you've had experience in ER settings, emergency department. And if so, here's what you will have experienced. Many times, people who have attempted suicide, survived, come to the ER or, or sit at the ER, and they have plenty of alcohol on board. And to that, I respond, true. But they're not dead. This is a different group. Our idea here is that in order to carry through all the way to the very fearsome end point of death, most people are sober. Else, you wouldn't be able to do something this hard. That's, that's, the, that's the logic here. Any thoughts, questions about that? Yes. Yes. Gotcha. Gotcha. I'm going to repeat that in a moment and answer it in a moment, but you've reminded me of something else I forgot to get to. Very important. I started, I made a big deal out of long-term time frame versus short-term. This is about the short-term time frame. I forgot to talk about the long-term, and that's where it's kind of confusing because in the long-term years, decades leading up to this, tons of alcohol misuse. It's really the modal profile. So putting that all together, what you got is alcohol misuse history predictive of suicidal death outcomes. But even in people with very troubled alcohol relationships for years, even a lot of them, their blood alcohol content looks like this at the time of death. All right. To circle back around to your question, it's about like the role of disinhibition, impulsivity, those kinds of things. And it is certainly true that alcohol is a disinhibitory agent. That's interesting to ponder because there have been ideas on suicide for really centuries, certainly decades, chalking suicide up to a kind of impulse, kind of a all of a sudden sort of thing. If that were true, this would look different. So both things stay true. Alcohol is a disinhibitory agent. And yet, what I'm sort of suggesting is that in order to do this, death, you can't be disinhibited. you got to be focused. you got to be able to stare something down that's difficult and fearsome. All right. Mm -hmm. As I pull up another video, go ahead. Yeah. True. Yeah. That's, 
Yes, I have, oh, and I've. Sorry, go ahead. We thought that the point on that last point is the difference between desire for death versus desire to not live, and in the pain, putting the, the suffering behind you, and that's a fair point that we looked into for decades. It actually, both actually be are, are involved for sure. You'd be surprised though if if you look into that literature over the course of decades. The one trumps the other. The desire for death, that trumps even what you're talking about, which is also involved. It's true. Both are involved. All right, let's look at this. This is just an interview. There's nobody going to get hurt, but he's talking about... Wait a minute. Get that off of there. Where did that video go? Thank you. I've been doing this for 25 years. I still can't get it right. All right. This guy's going to be talking about non-suicidal self-injury, which is, you know, in the neighborhood of suicidal behavior, but it's different because the motive is not to die. That's why it's called non-suicidal self-injury, but it's still real relevant because it's a gateway, so to speak. If you do a lot of what he's going to be talking about, non-suicidal self-injury, you'll incidentally teach your body a lesson of fearlessness. And then down the road, should you develop genuine desire to die, well, your body already knows the fearlessness that it's required um, to do that. So let's just listen to some of what he says about that. I've cut myself uh, a lot and I've ingested things like bed hooks. Uh, one time a cassette walkman down at Lucasville breaking it up and swallowing it piece by piece. And, uh, you know, bed, like I said, bed hooks, razor blades, ink pens, pencils, toothbrushes. October of last year at Lucasville, I ingested four ounces of what is it, magic shave. It's what it's called, powdered magic shave. It's like Nair, but it's in powder forms for men, beard remover, hair remover, with 10 ink pens and a paper clip. And I still have the last x-ray, I think, showed five ink pens in the paper clip. How does one swallow, is it a radio, or what is it that you swallowed? I swallowed a cassette Walkman AM FM radio, and just crush it up in chunks and slivers, and just bend my head back and push it down my throat, and immediately drink water and swallow it down. And why are you doing that? I do that for many reasons. Sometimes the reasons are I'm depressed, or I'm stressed, or, you know, all... Forgot to mention... Quickly, count count the blinks. So just to, you know, what I call pull a move to, you know, go to OSU or Oakwood just to get just to get out of this environment, the ignorance and, you know, the the what I call the animal the animalisticality of all this, you know, just the, the hell of it. You know, I get tired of it, need a break. And OSU and Oakwood, the staff and COs and mental health, they're different, they're real. You know, I can I would say that they're human beings. And one Oakwood is a hosp more like a hospital setting? Yes, okay. Oakwood is a like is a mental hospital for prisoners that are in prison. <clears throat> so And is that a relief to get out of prison? Yes, to just to get out of this environment, get away from it for a while. And and so you so you consciously do that, or is it part of your illness, or explain to me what that uh, is? I, I consciously do this, and it's a part of my illness. I know and understand that I don't have to do this, that I can control this if I, you know, want to. And it's not that I am stupid or to the point that I can. It's just I don't care. When, I'm, when I get stuck in a thought, I go all the way with it, and, and, I, <clears throat> and I don't care of the consequences that I'll suffer or I'll cause other. How many blinks did you count? <laughs> Probably lost. You lose count? A lot of blinks. That's normal blink rate. I would argue that... Let me... Uh, get back to this image here. This 
that guy we just heard about, the, let's the focus on the, on the reddish part. Does he have that characteristic? Is he fearless about physical ordeal? I would suggest he's, an actually, he's actually an exemplar of that. But does he want to die? Not at the time. Thus, he's got a normal blink rate. That's not imminent for him. And so he's got nothing to be daunted by. Death's not coming in minutes or hours for him. Normal blink rate. But he's got that capacity. And should he develop, for whatever reason, the, 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 the things on the left, then we got a dangerous individual there who both desires and clearly has the capacity for death by suicide. He's also a little unemotional about some things that are really provocative. And, and by the way, he's only touched on a, a, on a fraction of the behaviors in which he engages. They're numerous and frequent. He, he talked about a few, but not all of them. All right. I'll talk for, about this for a moment, timely, because tomorrow the Winter Olympics start. Hopefully we get another one of these. Not likely, but hopefully. Uh, if you don't know what it is, it's the Winter Olymp Olympics of 1980. And it's called the Miracle on Ice because it was a hockey game on ice. And it was a miracle that the U.S. beat the Soviets in that game. If you're of a certain age, you might even remember where you were in the room where, where you watched this. I do. It's called Flashbulb Memory. If you're too young, there's a Disney movie for you. Literally, there is. It's called Miracle or Miracle Nice. I can't remember. Story is epic upset. <clears throat> Should not have happened. Did. Very, very compelling sports story, but it was a lot bigger than that. Soviets, at this time, Soviets, were just into Afghanistan. Our hostages still in Iran. This is a big deal. And so we reasoned, might this date, it was February 22nd of 1980, might that particular February 22nd be special? When the country, because of the miracle on ice, rallied together, pulled together. And if so, we reasoned, Suicide rates should go down because belongingness, when it's good, decreases suicide rates. When it's bad and when people don't feel like they belong, increases suicide rates. And as a matter of fact, that is what happened. February 22nd of 1980 is the low point, historical low point for suicides in the United States on a February 22nd in recorded U.S. history. Same setup here kind of on the, on the up and down axis. You got numbers, just numbers in a, in, in a given date. Along the bottom here, though, you got different years. This is a February 22nd of years in the 70s and 80s. And right there in the middle is a low point. Date of the miracle on ice. Any number of things now could be driving something like that. But now we've got converging evidence from multiple fields, including different sporting events, including different other kinds of events that rally the country together for different reasons. 9-11, for example. Great example. Very different than this. And yet suicide rates went down even farther on 9-11. Why? It's not a celebration. 9-11 wasn't. This was, but 9-11 wasn't. 
the commonality, country rally together. Suppresses suicide rates. Togetherness suppresses suicide rates. Disconnection, loneliness, alienation spurs suicide. Let's talk about a key clinical implication of this idea. It's that small doses, or big doses, but even small doses of caring go a long way, disproportionately go a long way in terms of their health effects, their mental health effects and their physical health effects. Caring, it sounds cliche, it sounds corny maybe, Pollyannish to you, okay? Not relevant, though, as compared to what the data say, and the data say caring, small dose of it, big effects on things like suicide. We know that from things like this, but we know it from a literature that's called the Caring Letters Literature. What's that? Original study in the 70s, very vulnerable people in the mental health system in California, in this case, randomized to two groups. One, follow up as usual. The other got a caring letter in the mail every so often. That's the only intervention. A caring letter. That's it. That's the only difference between the two groups. That's a small dose of caring. Mattered. That group who got the letter had lower death rates, suicide death rates than the group who was treated just the same, except for the letter. That's the only thing that differed. That was a caring letter. Fast forward to 2018. Matt mentioned that I direct the DOD's Military Suicide Research Consortium. One of the first studies we funded was to see if caring letters work, but... That's 20th century letter. This is the 21st century. Caring texts was that study. In fact, the name of the study originally was the Caring Texts Study. That didn't sound right to our military partners. They changed the name to the Military Continuity Project. It's their money their money they get to choose and, and don't get me wrong I, I could not be more honored and more pleased to have anything at all to do with the DOD that worked caring texts worked caring letters worked small doses of caring work if you have a kind of mindset actually I have the same mindset of this sounds kind of corny Sounds kind of cliche. Works. That's not corny. <laughs> what works in trials like that, that's not corny. That's effective. I think I heard somebody mention, does it matter if you know who the letter's coming from? No. Nope. The original investigators thought that, so they hand wrote those letters. Every one of them, they hand wrote it. Subsequent studies, though, automated the whole thing. And that's really important in a 21st century mental health context, not only because of this kind of technology, but also because of demand on mental health systems. It's hard for an actual person to be delivering care to the hundreds and the thousands and the millions of people who need it. I wish it were like that. I wish it were a lot better in our country. It's not. Maybe we're improving, but it's not there yet. Bad news. A little piece of good news, we can automate a fair amount of it in a way that's effective. Small doses of caring, even automated caring, can go a long way. All right, so any thoughts or questions? Yes. Yes, thank you for reminding me. Um, those are the peaks on this graph. There are a couple of them. Pretty pronounced, aren't they? Um, one is an 88 on this graph. 
February 22nd, 88. Um, there's another there. I think it's 77. Care to guess? Sorry? Stock market crash in October of 87. So that maybe and economic things can matter for, for sure. Here's the, this is a little bit of a trick question because what this is probably is a day of the week effect. Monday and Tuesday, week in and week out, Monday, Tuesday, suicide peak weekly. Trails off Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Monday and Tuesday goes back up. Trails off rest of the week. Sure enough, these are those peaks are happening on Mondays and Tuesdays. It's probably a day of the week. It could be economic. It could be a lot of things. And if it were just this one study, you wouldn't necessarily put too much stock in it, but it's not just this. It's now hundreds. And it's all that combined with the caring letters, all that combined with things like caring text. It's really, it's a robust thing and hopeful because a small deliverable dose of something that a lot of us can provide can go a long way. Other thoughts or questions? Yes, sir. We like to bring up politics, but there, there's a division in our country. Yeah. In the, in the last election, there was a great division. Yeah. Any, any impact? Or is it too soon? It's too soon to say. The question is about political divides and might that have an effect. I think it probably would if the divide were sort of universal. But it, there's a clear divide, there, and it doesn't matter what. To think, that's for sure. You can't, not really debatable about, is there a divide or not? Yeah, that's not up for debate. Exactly where I was going. Within your subgroup, though, belongingness might have gone up. You know? So, this is complicated. And also, it's too early to tell. But I, 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 I don't predict that there will be an increase because of that latter thing where you get more belonging, depends on who you are and what you think, but, you know, you get more belonging with your own, you know, group. However you want to think about that. Okay. I'm going to wrap up in a, yeah, five, ten minutes. Let me show you a couple of examples that really, they're vivid about this, this idea. Actually, I'm going to mute this. Works better for these. I can do it up here. There you go. All right. This is from this is from a documentary called The Bridge. Anybody seen this documentary, The Bridge? Yeah, several of you have. So you might remember some of this footage. And you might remember the backstory of this. Again, we're not going to see anybody get hurt or killed here, but we're going to see a kind of close call and a rescue. And Backstory of this film is that the documentary filmmakers, they were at, in San Francisco at the Golden Gate, set up hundreds of yards away, zoom lensing, just, just captured hours and hours of endless footage of people walking back and forth across Golden Gate. And mostly they captured very mundane footage. Like this. That's what they saw. What do you make of that? Or this? At risk? How do you know? That's their dilemma. Except for this guy who's there to indulge his hobby, probably not at risk. And there's some of the photos he took. I'm pausing it again. They didn't know. But what they quickly learned is that the people that they thought were at risk were not. They were fine, mostly. And the ones who, within a minute, had plunged to their death, they didn't know. They didn't suspect anything. You can't just eyeball it like this. They quickly learned that idea. We're going to see a particular instance. Where that first girl, now she's on the wrong side of this railing. Very dangerous. People almost always die from this spot if they jump. Not always, but almost 99% of the time they die. Very dangerous spot. 
Remember that question I asked you about the prisoner, the guy who was interviewed in prison? Does he have the capacity? Is he fearless? And the answer is, yeah, he does. Does she? On the one hand, yeah, a little bit at least. She's on the wrong side of a very, very scary prospect. On the other hand, let's watch what happens as she's rescued. Her rescuer is the photographer. And let's track a couple of parameters. Does she fight for death? How hard? And does she help toward life, towards rescue? Think about those questions. Nobody gets hurt here, much less killed. Okay, here's a rescue, and here's the fight. Here's the struggle. How, how, how strenuous is this fight? Nah, not, not really. And then watch her help. Watch her legs. Does she help her rescue? Look at legs right there. Yeah, a little bit. But then she gets, and she struggles, and he's got to just pull her right over. He just pulls her right over because from the other side there, she's still fighting him. There's a lot of fight in her. Or death. Nevertheless, you could see it kick in. Her, le- her body kicked in and, and helped in her own rescue. And, and, and credit to that photographer. That's a good Samaritan right there. And he kept at it because she tried to get back over the rail and jump. He sat on her. He just basically didn't know what else to do. Sat on her stomach until the authorities came and took over. That's the vivid illustration of the principle I'm talking about. I would take it as granted. She's got desire, at least some. But in the crucial moment, capacity wasn't quite enough for her to end up in that area of overlap. It's a little over 7.30. Let me, let me show one more of these. Even, even more dramatic. Okay, that happened. Here's when and where it happened. When is relevant because that's, that's the month of July. That's the, that's the suicide peak. May, June, July. Isn't that interesting? You might have heard just the opposite. That's not true. The, the opposite, what you often hear is now, you know, December, January into February. No, that's, that's the low point, actually. The high point is the summer, when people get a little more energy. Energy needed to do something like this. What else is going on in, in December, November, December, into January, when we got suicide low points? togetherness. It's the holidays, bringing people together. And suicide rates go down. So this is, fast forward, this requires a little bit of a setup. And then I'm going to wrap up and take some questions. In this car is Ms. Tina Zahn. And Ms. Zahn wrote a a memoir. It's actually a pretty gripping memoir. It's called Why I Jumped. Revealing. I learned a lot from it. Ms. Zahn, promoting her book, got this footage from law enforcement, posted it to her website. It's from her website. Ms. Zahn is in that car. She had been at home minutes previously in the midst of a terrible depressive episode, about her 25th discreet episode of major depressive disorder in her relatively young life. She's 35 or so at the time. Already 20 discreet episodes, 20 plus. Bad illness. Moreover, in some of her past episodes, fully catatonic. In other words, mute and immobile, both. 
in this episode, by contrast, edgy, angry, irritable, keyed up, agitated, hadn't been sleeping. When she does sleep a little bit, nightmares. That's a pretty common picture in the days and weeks before death by suicide. She's at home. Family members kind of understand what's going on. In fact, Ms. Zahn has said she's thinking about going to this bridge and jumping to her death. Family members lose track for a moment. Sure enough, Ms. Zahn leaps into the car, speeds off. Notice the behavior at home. Death not quite yet imminent. And so she's sped up, speeds away, leaps in the car. At the bridge, death is imminent, and she gets slowed down a little bit. Saves her life. Family members figure it out, call 911. Officers find her, and here's what happens. Very dramatic. Nobody hurt here. Miraculously, much less killed. I'm actually going to stop it in a few seconds and ask, ask you a question. Right here. What have you noticed so far? That's just two seconds. What, that, that's, that, that's right. There's two things, actually, at least. One is that she pretty deliberately and slowly closes the door. Often... When people are trying to escape from law enforcement, like in a, in a sense she is, she knows that they're behind her, they, they don't close the door. They just run. She did. She's a little slowed down. Compared to at the house when she ran, sped, leapt, things like that. And that's the other thing. How fast is she walking? I mean, you know, it could be slower, I guess, but it's not a sprint, you know. It's a little... Slow down. Death is imminent. Could be imminent. And so she gets daunted. That's only natural. It's how we're wired. All right, she's going to get daunted even more so because she hesitates at the railing. That hesitation is crucial because she's going to get saved. Barely. Jumps. Caught in midair. And pulled back up, still fighting. Brave police officer. Strong police officer. Could have been two deaths there. What accounts for phenomena like that? I think part of it is this thing we've been talking about on the right side of the slide you got to have a, a, a really high level of that to not be daunted and to run through, to not blink and to not flinch in the face of death. I've focused mo mo mostly on the right side of the model. I mentioned a little bit on the left with burdensomeness, caring, belonging, loneliness, that kind of stuff too. I wanted to note very quickly there are hundreds of risk factors for suicide. This model doesn't really dismiss all those. It merely says there is a common final pathway through which all those factors operate. And it's that convergence of those three variables. That's the claim here. If that's true, clinically... It reduces the number of things you got to keep track of from hundreds to a few. In the modern 21st century mental health context, that's important. Already touched on how caring connections can save lives. You can imagine how that happens in many formats. I've mentioned caring letters, caring texts. We might mention connection to community whether that's religious, secular, or what have you, civic, political, doesn't matter, community. 
I would throw in regarding burdensomeness, it's opposite. What's the opposite of feeling like you burden everybody? It's feeling like you matter, like you contribute. Small doses of that also go a long way. Tiny doses of that go a long way. And that has pretty real day-to-day clinical op- implications for what you do in terms of managing suicide risk. It makes it much more manageable, seemingly at least, from this thing that seems mysterious and intractable to, all right, let me focus on right now. Can I give a small dose of caring? Can I give a small dose of meaning, purpose, contribution, mission? And while we're at it, on the point of fearlessness, what can you do clinically about it? Once somebody has it, they have it. But there's still something to do, and it's called means safety. If you got somebody who's real fearless, like think about that prisoner, that fellow that we saw being interviewed in prison. Now let's imagine his release. Let's imagine somehow or other, perhaps illegally, he manages upon his release to obtain at least one weapon. And he begins to ponder self-inflicted gunshot wound. Would it matter to introduce a little bit of distance between him and the weapon? Instead of it being right there, it's bed stand, loaded. What if it were in a closet up there in a container with a latch? And how about we throw in a safety lock, a gun lock to boot? Does that make a difference? You might counter, no. If he's determined to do it, he's gonna, that seems like it might be true. It's not. That distance makes a world of dif- difference. Means safety. And the idea is applicable across suicide methods, which maybe we can talk a little bit more about if there are any questions and answer to this. Let me just quickly remind you of what I think is a very exciting initiative that that. I feel real privileged to have anything to do with. I get to direct it, as a matter of fact. Here's the website of it. If you'd like to follow up on our work with our DOD partners, the whole point of this effort, it's interesting because I'm an academic psychologist, and I'm interested in theory. I'm interested in science, and I'm interested in scholarship. DOD came to me and said, we're not interested in any of that. Fix this and fix it today. That's understandable where their mind was at. And so I had to get into a different mindset of very applied quickly. And that's what these interventions are all about is things that work, that can be put on something like this, that a 20-year-old male who's enlisted in the Army, for instance, will listen to. That's, that's, what this, that's what this is geared towards, because that's, that's, who, that's who's typical. That's modal, of course, in our, in our military. With that, just, just to reiterate, it's MSRC, Military Suicide Research Consortium, .fsu.edu. I'm at Florida State University. Thank you all for coming here tonight. Thank you for your attention.